Raise your hands if you think that hurricanes with a female name, like Hurricane Katrina or Cindy, sound more deadly than hurricanes with a male name, like Andrew or Henry. Raise your hands, please. And raise your hands if you don't agree with that. Thank you very much. Actually, hurricane names have nothing to do with how deadly they are. This is a predefined list that goes from A to Z. But according to some research, hurricane names got a bad reputation, especially female names, because when hurricanes are coming and they have a female name, people tend to underestimate them. And because they underestimate the hurricane with a female name, they don't prepare as good as they should. And this leads to more dangerous consequences. And this is bias. Bias is essentially what I'm going to be talking about today. So, as a definition, bias is a preconception, mostly an unconscious error in the information that you have that will affect your conclusion and is largely used in a negative context. Imagine if you're growing up in a house and you're always listening to, there are some type of people that are dangerous, that shouldn't be trusted, and you constantly listen to that. And you don't question this information, and you grew up with this information, and eventually you're going to think that these people are dangerous and you're perhaps not even going to check it. So, this is bias. And why bias? Why am I talking about that? Just as a summary, bias is going to influence your behavior. And your behavior is going to be documented as information. And information is data. And data is the basis of an artificial intelligence model. So the data that you're going to be feeding this artificial intelligence model is the data that perhaps was based on a biased decision. OK, I know this was a little bit too fast. Don't worry. Let me walk you a little bit through history. So in the 1940s and in the 1950s, IT, information technology, was a female-dominated industry. Yes, in the 1950s, IT was considered women's work. It was not a high-status job, not at all. It was considered secretarial, it was data entry, it was labor that men didn't want to do. And this combined with World War II, men had to serve in the military, and industries like engineering, they were growing, so they needed people. They recruited women massively. Women were responsible for the ballistic calculations during World War II. And just as a teacher is teaching, a woman who is computing is a computer. They were the human computers. Yes, but this didn't last very long, because in the 1960s, it started to decline. So essentially, in the 1960s, with the rise of computing industry, IT started to be seen as more technical, more academic. And combined with the hurdles of women to get into university, to become a professor, to stay in university, to become researchers. By 1980s, 1985, women were still 39, almost 40% of the computer science bachelors. But by 2016, 17%. And why am I talking about ICT, right? Because ICT essentially is uh, a very male-dominated industry that used to be a female-dominated industry. But if you look in the past, if you look into several different industries, you are going to see very similar trends. And it hurts me to say, I, I've been in STEM, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics. I've been in STEM for my whole career. And I have seen things happening to women around me. And at some point, unpleasant things have happened to me as well. I was once giving a presentation just like this one today. The, the audience was a bit different. It was 100 CEOs. And th they were trying to grasp the concepts of gender equality and the glass ceiling and so on. And in the end of the, the talk, one of the general managers came to me. And he said, Karen, the glass ceiling and gender bias, this is not an issue. We don't find women, and that is the issue. 
Okay. And then he started to talk about this role that he had that was super exciting. And he would love to have a woman taking this position of leadership, but he couldn't find anyone. And funnily enough, it was exactly the role that I had at the time. I thought he knew it. So I looked at him and I joked, hey, I'm going to send you my CV. <laughs> oh, no, Karen, no. Yeah, it's too tough. You're not going to enjoy it. He, he quickly came up with three reasons why I should not even send my CV. And I'm sorry, but I do have to wonder how many times I still need to go to stages and talk about the same issues over and over again. And especially because these issues, they're leading to dangerous inequalities. They are leading to dangerous inequalities, and they are leading to a gap in our data, a gender data gap. So let me give you three examples. University of Virginia, 2019, based on their research, they discovered that women are 73% more likely to be seriously injured in a car crash, and they are 17% more likely to die in a car crash. Women are 17% more likely to die in a car crash, and it's not because they're bad drivers or they're driving more recklessly, no. It's because when they are doing the research on how the car reacts to a crash, they use a male puppet, a male mannequin, and they take the data out of that. And if they want to try to understand how women react to the crash, they get this male dummy, they make it smaller, and they put it in the passenger seat. 17% more likely to die. And this was at the same time that Carolina Criado Paris launched the book Invisible Women on the same topic. And it sparkled the curiosity of researchers. Are women indeed experiencing life differently? And then all sorts of data started to pop up. This round from uh, University of Toronto, 2022. This is just from last year. Women are 32% more likely to die if operated by male surgeons. And this is very recent research. It's just from last year, and it was not a small one. It was 1.3 million patients and 3,000 surgeons. And they're still trying to understand why, but there is already evidence that this is linked to unconscious bias. Just to give an example, unconscious bias, imagine if you have just been operated, you have pain, you go to a doctor, you say, I have pain, and the doctor thinks you're exaggerating. And it doesn't investigate as thoroughly as no enough, and it ends up with you not surviving the operation. And the first example was to talk about how women experience products. The second example was to talk about how women experience services. And the third example is to talk about how women experience society. This one is from 2020, it's a master's thesis from Ghent University, from adjunct major Katja Beisse, from the Belgium Army. During her research, she discovered that 67% of the Belgian military women declared that they have been harassed during their career. 43% physically harassed, such as unwanted touching, and 9% have reported rape. I hope you understand how crucial it is to have data on gender, to, to understand how women are experiencing society. Because right now, our main issue is that we don't have data, and the data that we have is biased, biased because of our behaviors. And now you get this data, you feed it into an artificial intelligence model, and you have the recreation of these biases everywhere. A company once decided to automate their recruiting without knowing that the recruiting from person to person was biased, so they got the CV of everyone that was hired and they put it into an AI model. And the AI model noticed notice, that they didn't hire many women. So the AI model put two and two together and decided that if it would see the word woman, women, 
it would penalize the CV and not send it over. So if you put in your CV winner of the Women in IT Awards, penalized. Yes. Um, credit cards. A couple applied for a credit card together. Well, they applied separately, but at the same time, they had the same income, same debt, same expenses. And finally, the woman was given a credit that was 20 times lower. In fact, her credit score was a little bit higher, but when she was awarded the credit card, it was 20 times lower. And then they put this on social media, and there were people like, oh, uh, this happened to me too, 10 times lower. Yeah, 10 times, this is not a typo. Do you see where I'm going? You're going to feed this data, this biased data, into an artificial intelligence model. And it's going to be replicated in defense, in finance, in healthcare. Don't get me wrong. I love artificial intelligence. I'm an engineer. That's precisely why I'm here today. I want it to work for me as well. So how do we make artificial intelligence safe? Easy, we feed it unbiased data. No, it's a joke, it's not easy. It's not easy because the data is a mere reflection of our society, which is biased. Yes, there are ways to unbiased this data. There are ways to make this data even less biased than the average human. Just imagine an AI model that is less biased than the average human. Imagine how GPT is going to revolutionize knowledge management. How artificial intelligence is going to find cancer faster. I want to be part of this. I want to. So going back to, to the theme of this TEDx, reset. How do we reset the reality that we have right now? If I had a reset button next to me, I would reset women being pushed out of leadership. I would reset women being pushed out of technology, of decision making. I would reset this massive data gap that we created. They're costing women their lives. It's your daughter driving. It's your mother being operated. But I cannot reset. There is no button. There is no button, but there are solutions. So what I want you to take home today, the sense of urgency because working in gender equality, working in female perspectives, this is not a fluffy agenda. This is not some political agenda, quotas and good impressions, no. This is very important. I want you to understand the consequences if we don't work on that. I want you to get educated on unconscious biases, and I want you to, next time you hear Hurricane Karen, you don't underestimate it. Thank you very much.